Hello, welcome to our first, I hope, I hope of many, one of many, um, forecasting US-China trade relationships with Anna Ashton. She will be going through some wonderful statistics and facts for us so we can learn a lot more about it. Um, about relationships with China. My name is Denise Thomas, and I am the Director of Africa Middle Eastern Trade with the World Trade Center Arkansas. And I wanna welcome you for being here today. And I'm going to dive right in because I am really excited to hear about what at Anna has to say, and I'm looking forward to knowing a lot more. Now, I do want to make sure everyone knows that there is a chat and you can ask questions in that chat and I will do my best to keep up with you because I don't, I don't keep up as fast as you guys type. I found that that is something that I need to improve upon. So um, I will chat back with Anna and let her know if there's questions and things that need to be answered. I hope you guys enjoy this and thank you so much for your participation. Anna, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Denise. I'm glad to be with everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Anna Ashton. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs at the US-China Business Council, which is a trade association representing about 250 American companies with business in China. Uh, I'm also an Arkansas native, born and raised in Little Rock, and I worked for a brief time at the Ar Arkansas Economic Development Commission about 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, it's always great when my work life intersects with my home, my home state. Um, really happy to be here with you virtually, and I'm looking forward to sharing our perspectives on the current state of the U.S.-China relationship, uh, plus hopefully hearing from some of you. Um, so first, a little bit more about the U.S.-China Business Council. As I mentioned, we represent about 250 American companies that do business with China. Um, we are a private, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded in 1973 around the time that Nixon and Kissinger normalized relations with the People's Republic of China. We provide, in our opinion, unmatched information, advisory, advocacy, and programming services to our member companies through our three offices, our headquarters in Washington, DC, and our two China offices in Shanghai and in Beijing. Um, next slide, please. Our mission is to advocate for a US-China commercial relationship that benefits our member companies and that serves the interests of the US economy more broadly. We favor constructive, results-oriented engagement with China to eliminate trade and investment barriers and develop a rules-based commercial environment that is predictable and transparent to all parties. This year, we're trying to expand our reach and help more medium-sized American businesses better understand the US-China relationship so that they're better equipped to take advantage of potential opportunities or manage challenges. And we hope, hope to connect with economic development professionals at the state level in Arkansas and elsewhere um, to serve as a no cost resource to, to them as they serve their own communities, businesses who are thinking about uh, how to better take advantage of opportunities in the US-China trade and commercial relationship. Next slide, please. This is a, a little bit more about our services as a resource for understanding the China market. And next slide, please. Uh, we're a voice and a wind chime, as my colleague China Haas likes to say. We engage with US government stakeholders to explain business positions and to understand their perspectives and concerns. We also ensure that US business interests in China are understood and considered by various Chinese government agencies during the regulatory development process. Uh, we're consistently talking to both governments about the impact of tariffs and many other, many other things. Next slide, please. The US-China commercial relationship should be one that delivers for everyone and our, our view is that a fair rules-based relationship is good not only for US interests, not only for our member companies' interests, but for the interests of other countries too. The way we see it, everyone gains when there is a fair, predictable, rules-based and well-functioning international trading system. Everyone is hurt by the lack of it. China is incredibly and increasingly influential in the international trading system, and it has never been more important to ensure that China is playing by the rules. Next slide, please. 
Trade with China supports, so uh, let's see. Oh no. Uh, actually, can you, can you go one more? One more, sorry. There we go, okay. Um, trade with China supports American jobs. The combined goods and services exports from the US to China um, supported nearly a million jobs in 2019, the most recent year for which comprehensive data is available. In 2020, the global economy of course, significant shifts because of the public health and related economic activity. 19 and the US China commercial relationship was certainly no exception. But in 2020, the United States and China signed and implemented the phase one trade agreement and halted tariff escalations for the first time in two years. As a result, last year actually saw a healthy recovery of goods exports to China. Services exports haven't fared quite as well, but the data on services is also about a year behind. Um, so we don't have the ability to fully assess where things stand there. What we do know is that the latest data that is available um, showed that services exports had fallen for the first time since 2003. As you can see on the map, Arkansas was among the states that we found saw modest China trade related employment gains in 2019. All right, next slide, please. And when we talk about the, the potential that the relationship offers, something that often gets raised is the idea that U.S. companies are just outsourcing jobs to China to be done more cheaply and then importing cheap goods back into the U.S., but that's not really what defines the relationship these days. Most of our member companies are in China for China. China is driving global economic growth. It is the second largest economy in the world. Its GDP growth in 2019 was over 6%, and it's expected to grow at least that much this year as well. Though its overall growth in 2020 was less than 3%, the weakest in a long time, China still rebounded from COVID faster than any other major developed economy. China also has the world's largest and fastest growing middle class, more than the entire US population already. Um, and in fact, one, one statistic that I like to share when talking about this is that China's middle class is only about 15% of its population right now, whereas by the same calculation, the same measurement, the US middle class is about 50% of our population. Um, China's middle class is already larger than our entire population and it's rapidly growing. When it gets to the point that China's middle class is 50% of its population, uh, you can just imagine, how significant that market will be. Its per capita income is still also only about a quarter of that of high income countries, but incomes have been rapidly rising, fueling that middle class growth as well as stronger spending. Uh, a statistic that jumps out for a lot of people when they hear it, China has 989 million internet users right now. So e-commerce um, and e-commerce platforms in China, um, they, they do far more business than we see here in the United States. For many US companies, China is a top five global market and profits from success in that market ensure their overall competitiveness as well as fueling their research and development spending here at home, allowing us to better compete with other countries, including China, both economically and technologically. Next slide, please. Uh, despite the challenges, China is and will in all likelihood continue to be economically significant to the United States. It is still our third largest trading partner despite tariffs in a trade war that has been ongoing for four and a half years. U.S. exports to China increased 18% last year to 123.1 billion U.S. dollars. This was a, a good performance. It is appropriate to note it is less than 2017, which was the benchmark year for exports covered under the phase one agreement. Uh, in 2017, exports reached 128 billion. An 18% overall increase in exports lifts many boats. The agricultural heartland of the United States and the energy producing parts of the US definitely increased exports significantly last year. Exports of transportation equipment though were not strong um, and we saw declines in other sectors. From a China customs per perspective though, US imports increased 10% during 2020, which was an excellent performance overall. Next slide. So to the rest of the discussion, um, I wanted to start with sort of a level set. Where is the US-China trade relationship? Um, we're in the middle of a strategic tectonic shift. Commercially, a change in the relationship was overdue. Um, at, in 2016, during the presidential campaign, 
before President Trump was elected. Um, both the Clinton campaign and the Trump campaign talked a lot about um, the need to get tough on China. That was a, a featured message for both of their campaign platforms. And this was the case in the 2020 presidential election as well. We're in the midst of this geostrategic shift in the relationship because China has become uh, far more powerful economically than it was when it joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. Um, and, and it is time really for a reassessment of of the relationship and various aspects of it um, to make sure that it's calibrated in the interest, not just of China, but of the United States. Uh, so it's, it's appropriate that we're in the middle of this shift, but because we're in this shift, <laughs> there are a lot of uncertainties about what the relationship is going to look like in the future when the dust settles. So I'll start with um, the commercial side of the relationship. Commercial, the commercial side of the relationship has just featured uh, an increasing amount of tension and also unpredictability. The Trump administration had a stated priority of rebalancing the trade relationship um, and used tariffs and negotiation of the phase one trade agreement to try to accomplish that. Right from the get-go, President Trump was focused on correcting the bilateral trade imbalance. Um, there was a brief attempt by his administration at forging ahead with a comprehensive dialogue like the ones that had been held throughout the George W. Bush administrations and the Obama administration. Um, but the dialogue quickly crumbled and soon thereafter, um, we had the, the 301 investigation and findings. And then uh, we found ourselves in an escalating trade war with numerous rounds of tariffs imposed by both sides. By late 2019, we had tariffs ranging from 15% to 25% in place on nearly $400 billion worth of imports from China, including machinery imports, industrial supplies, and consumer-focused goods. China responded in kind with equivalent tariffs on U.S. goods, especially vehicles, agricultural commodities, oil, and natural gas, and capital equipment. Tariffs on Chinese goods entering the U.S. went from an average of 3.1% in 2018 to an average of 21% by the end of 2019, and tariffs on U.S. goods entering China went from an average of 8% in 2018 to 20.9% by late 2019. But we signed the phase one agreement in January 2020, and after nearly two years of tariff escalation, U.S. goods exports to China, again, were up almost 18% in 2020. There were several factors involved here. A critical factor was the tariff exclusion mechanism that China put in place in order to meet phase one purchase targets. There were also market openings in phase one that have helped and will provide long-term benefits to U.S.-China trade and strong Chinese demand due to its quick economic recovery from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic also played a role. Um, in terms of progress on phase one, US CBC has been closely tracking China's progress implementing its commitments. These commitments generally fell into two categories, commitments to import certain quantities of goods from the United States and commitments to make structural regulatory changes. China has made actually significant progress on both fronts, resulting in tangible benefits for US businesses, though China has yet to fully deliver on all of its commitments. In terms of purchase targets, China committed to purchasing 200 billion of US agriculture, energy, and manufactured goods and services on top of 2017 levels over the course of 2020 and 2021. According to um, Peterson Institute analysis on US export data, China met 59% of its target for goods in 2020, purchasing similar levels to 2017, the last full year before China began imposing tariffs. This is despite China's tariff exclusion mechanism not beginning until March of last year and COVID-19 tanking Chinese demand at the outset of 2020. According to Peterson Institute estimates, the pandemic hit services exports to China harder, resulting in a 20% decrease in 2020, which needless to say, fell far short of China's phase one commitments. So far in 2021, Chinese progress on phase one purchases remain strong, though still short of target levels. In the four, first quarter of 2021, US goods exports to China covered under the agreement were at 54% of prorated target levels for the year. In terms of structural commitments, by our evaluation, China has either implemented or made progress towards the majority of its structural commitments too. In agriculture, China has improved market access for US poultry, beef, seafood, pet food, fruits, and vegetables. The government has also streamlined regulatory processes to register facilities approved to export a wide range of products. 
However, the two sides continue to engage in technical discussions on China's commitments to implement a transparent, predictable, and science-based biotech product approval process. In financial services, Chinese regulators have eliminated equity caps for foreign ownership of securities, fund management, futures, and insurance companies, and started granting licenses to majority and wholly foreign-owned companies. China has also opened fund custody services to foreign participation and streamlined, streamlined licensing procedures for e-payment and insurance. However, there are questions that remain around China's commitment um, on type A lead underwriting licenses, bank card clearing licenses, and the scope of futures products in which US financial institutions can invest. On intellectual property, China has made high level legal reforms to improve the protection of trade secrets, patents, and copyrights. However, while China has released numerous measures that will address phase one commitments once finalized, many of those currently remain in draft form or are awaiting detailed implementing measures. In short, the phase one agreement has led to many unambiguously positive openings for US companies in China, allowing them to compete on more equal footing with their Chinese counterparts. That respite um, that has been provided from Chinese tariffs too has led to a recovery in US exports to China, creating real benefits for American workers, farmers, and ranchers. But um, despite the United States reaching this phase one agreement with China in early 20, most of our tariffs on Chinese imports remain in place. The effective tariff rate remains at a multi-decade high and section, one, and section 301 exclusions um, have lapsed. So um, we're still in a tough place for businesses that rely on imports from China in order to manufacture here in the United States or otherwise um, fulfill their business, their business processes. So what did we gain from the trade war? Uh, well, on the other hand, there were, um, on the one hand, there were some measurable, measurable progress. Um, the bilateral trade deficit narrowed from 419 billion in 2018 to 346 billion in 2019, but this was offset by an increased trade deficit with the rest of the world, leaving the overall U.S. trade deficit pretty much unchanged. Um, the Phase One Agreement did achieve real progress, as described. Uh, the China, China also committed to this massive import of U.S. goods and services and has made big progress there. But on the other hand, the trade war did very little to address concerns about most of China's unfair trade practices because they weren't part of the um, phase one negotiation process. They were saved for phase two. Um, and in many ways, the trade war has harmed rather than restoring U.S. employment overall. Many academic and industry studies have found that the trade war has lowered U.S. GDP growth, welfare, and employment. And trade isn't the only top concern for policymakers in the relationship. Uh, it continues to be an ongoing subject of concern and certainly a high profile one, um, but it has been increasingly clear over the course of the past many months, especially in 2020, as the Trump administration delivered tougher and tougher messaging on China issues, and now in 2021, that uh, there's much more about the relationship that is concerning to policymakers here in the United States than, than simply the commercial aspects of the relationship. Top issues include technology competition, human rights, Taiwan, and, and many other things. So how is the Biden administration approaching the US-China trade relationship? What is the Biden administration's China strategy? Well, uh, the short answer is that they're still assessing, and that's what they have said in congressional testimony in recent weeks. Um, and you know, they announced that they were going to do a comprehensive assessment of the Trump administration's China policies, that they're also undergoing a comprehensive assessment and recalibration of US trade policy, um, and then also US China trade policy. And we have yet to have the results of these assessments, but all signs point to the Biden administration maintaining a viewpoint that is generally aligned with the Trump administration on China, even if its tactics may end up being a bit different. Um, some of the tactics we expect to be different and have seen signs uh, that they will be different are uh, the Biden administration seems more intent on taking a multilateral approach to addressing a variety of different China challenges. And it is um, more focused on boosting our own domestic competitiveness versus, um, as, you know, versus putting penalties on China for their misbehavior. There is a penalty component 
um, to the Biden administration's approach, but there's a much heavier focus on how do we make ourselves stronger so that we can rise to this challenge. Um, both Washington and Beijing have been increasing scrutiny of each other, especially foreign direct investment in the past few years. And the tech sector has been a sensitive piece for both countries. Since 2016, China has moved to restrict or control outbound investment to limit capital outflows. And we're seeing very similar actions um, over the course of the last several years from, from the US government and the Biden administration has continued this trend. Um, the Biden administration is still um, conducting this top to bottom review of the previous administration's process, but we, we absolutely expect that um, the investment scrutiny and, and the trade restrictions are going to uh, remain in place by and large, and in some cases increase. That doesn't mean that the tariffs won't eventually go away, but we know that they're not slated to be rolled back in any comprehensive manner in the near term. And Congress is very much maintaining political pressure on the administration to take a tough approach to China. Congress is working on an enormous bipartisan effort to address the China challenge with a focus on bolstering America's ability to compete in key technology sectors, as well as strengthening IP protection and increasing scrutiny of Chinese participation in these sectors. In this Congress, we're currently tracking 158 China-related proposals, 135 bills and 23 resolutions, or that was our count as of late last week. <laughs> it may be, may be bigger now. Um, we're on pace right now to outstrip China's proposals in the last Congress, or China-related proposals in the last Congress, which topped 550. And to put the last Congress's China proposals in perspective, comparing that to the 107th Congress, 2001 and 2002, when there was strong bipartisan resolve to pass counter-terror related legislation and prevent future terrorist attacks in the United States because it was just after September 11th, uh, Congress introduced only 135 counter-terror related proposals. So 135 counter-terror related proposals right after September 11th versus 550 China related proposals in the last Congress and already 158 or more China related proposals in this one that started in January. Uh, by that measure, the sense of China as a menace among members of Congress right now would seem to far exceed the sense of Al Qaeda as a menace in the immediate aftermath of September 11th. But to put it in a different perspective, there were 16,000 bills and resolutions introduced in the last Congress. And as is customary, only a fraction of those, 344 to be precise, became law. And of the 344 laws that were passed, only 15 were China related. To add more context and reason to remain calm, uh, while we have an awful lot of China-related proposals already circulating in this Congress, they too are just a fraction of the 5,000 or so bills and resolutions introduced since January. Lawmakers are still mostly focused on domestic issues such as the coronavirus pandemic, economic recovery, and still confirming Biden administration nominees. But China is a real hot button issue, particularly in the Senate right now. So what's going on in the Senate? Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat of New York, has repeatedly stressed since February that he wants to expedite legislation to address the China challenge, and this is widely seen as a bipartisan priority. He brought his much-touted China package um, for an initial cloture vote last Monday and said that he would bring it to the floor for Senate passage sometime before this Friday, May 28th, when lawmakers leave for Memorial Day weekend. Um, we don't know yet if we're actually going to see it come to the floor for a vote, but, uh, but he has been determined in his messaging about it. The base text of the bill is the Bipartisan Endless Frontier Act, which was introduced by Senator Schumer and Senator Young, Republican of Indiana. Um, it isn't actually inherently what I would describe as a China bill per se, except as the means of responding to the China challenge by taking steps to ramp up US competitiveness in the high tech arena. It was originally written to boost funding to 10 key high tech sectors and create hubs in different states, different parts of the country that would support research and development in those sectors. The sectors overlap, interestingly, with um, some industrial policy that China itself has rolled out called Made in China 2025. Um, so it, it raises questions about, I guess, the state of free market capitalism in the United States and how how committed we are to free market capitalism going forward in our, in our competition with China. But uh, it offers some real opportunity for states that end up being 
hubs if it, if it passes into law. Um, Schumer also encouraged different committee, committees in the Senate to offer their own bipartisan proposals for potential inclusion in a final package. And when he brought that package um, to senators on Monday of last week, uh, and it's now titled the United States Innovation and Competition Act of 2021, it did contain proposals, bipartisan proposals from several different committees, um, making it a, a very broad, far-reaching China-focused bill. Um, it passed its closure vote by 86 to 11, indicating that there is overwhelming bipartisan support for it. Uh, but then Schumer introduced an amendment to, to the bill the next day. And, and over the course of the last several days, including the weekend, uh, both Democrats and Republicans have introduced hundreds of amendments to his amendment um, with increasing reports that there is frustration among Republicans because there were things left out of the final deal, um, such as a reinstating uh, the tariff exclusions for most goods that had received an exclusion and, um, and some other trade measures that Senate finance ranking member Crapo had introduced. Um, this, has, this has rubbed numerous Republicans the wrong way in the Senate, as well as um, we're hearing in the House, and that's raised questions about exactly how much bipartisan support the bill is ultimately going to be able to gain if it um, doesn't incorporate some of the amendments that Republicans are introducing. Um, Pelosi can very probably be counted on if it passes the Senate to put it right on the floor in the House. Uh, the idea from the start has been that if enough senators are behind the bill to achieve sort of a super majority or better, then it should be easy to take the bill straight to the floor for a vote on the House side and expedite the process of making the bill law. Um, but again, if Republican concerns are not addressed, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. But it has been a surprising process to watch. We've seen it progress much more rapidly than we expected. We're keeping our eye on a bunch of amendments in the bill and there are numerous interesting um, pieces to the legislation as it was introduced even on Monday. Um, there are things like a requirement that the U.S. boycott the 2021 or 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, it's a diplomatic boycott. It doesn't call for a commercial boycott or um, non-inclusion of athletes in the games, but it could have a pretty significant impact on the trade relationship, uh, depending on how that plays out. Uh, there is also a proposal, a bipartisan proposal uh, from Senator Bob Casey, Democrat of Pennsylvania, and Senator Cornyn, Republican of Texas, now endorsed by other Democrats and Republicans um, that would create an outbound investment review mechanism, which would give uh, the federal government a lot more control and say over what kinds of transactions U.S. companies can engage in with Chinese with Chinese business partners. Uh, there's no guarantee that that will make it into the final bill, but it might. Um, there's also there's funding for the Chips Act in this bill. The Chips Act was a part of the National Defense Authorization Act last year and um, called for significant, many billions of dollars. Uh, funding to help reinvigorate the semiconductor industry in the United States and build fabs for producing chips in the United States. Uh, there's, a, there's an amendment that would allow the government to essentially take whatever it sees fit from companies that, that accept this funding um, in return for the funding. Uh, and I suspect that that's not gonna be a popular one um, with some lawmakers. So how is the geopolitical environment impacting U.S. business engagement and trade opportunity with China right now? Um, there's just an incredible amount of uncertainty. We still hear from our companies that China is a market they're committed to because, again, they're in China for China. The 80 percent of their operations in China are aimed at the China market itself or, or markets in the region. Um, they feel it is necessary to be competitive in China if they are to remain competitive globally. So they don't, um, they don't want to exit the market, but they are um, in many cases working hard to create redundancies in their supply chains, reduce their dependence on China in various parts of their supply chains to the extent 
that there is dependence, um, both because they um, see this as a coming requirement from lawmakers or from the Biden administration or both, and because um, the friction in the, in the bilateral relationship is such that it's uncertain exactly what policies China will roll out. Um, we feel that there is a bit of a disconnect in DC where policymakers in Washington are very understandably heavily focused on the geopolitical issues in the US-China relationship. But uh, when it comes to our bilateral economic engagement, this means they seem to be overlooking or discounting kind of the bread and butter benefits of bilateral trade and investment um, to US businesses and farmers and ranchers and workers and to the economy overall. So it's really important from our perspective that state voices are heard in Washington more, that grassroots realities are seen and understood and accounted for in the policymaking process. There are certainly plenty of lawmakers who are voicing these concerns, but it doesn't feel that the concerns are, um, are getting the airtime that they need relative to some of the sort of um, geopolitical, ideological, and other issues that are um, defining so much of, of the discussion around the US-China relationship right now. There are significant opportunities for US companies of all sizes in China still today, and we believe these opportunities can be seized most of the time without any compromise of national security or American values. Um, China is the fastest growing market with a middle class the size of the entire population of the US again, and China's economic plan has this number growing rapidly in the coming years, meaning even more Chinese will be able to afford US goods and services if we can just get the trade policies right. Um, so that is, that is the conclusion of uh, my prepared remarks. And I would welcome an opportunity to answer questions and discuss some of this stuff with anyone who has questions. Well, I'm gonna start that off because I actually have a couple of questions myself. Um, one of the things that you spoke about, <clears throat> you talked about so many different things. I think the thing that I wanna understand better is, where do you see some of the greatest opportunities for Arkansas companies in doing business with China? Where do you see some of the, the things that we might be able to do or be able to take advantage of? So I'm not, uh, I'm not an Arkansas expert, so of course I can't um, really speak to this nearly as well as probably some people um, who are on the line can. But I mean, certainly Arkansas has a major agriculture sector. Um, chicken exports, opportunity, beef exports, rice exports, um, soybean exports, you name it. Um, on the on the ag front, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, that's good to know. Um, we have a company that's on that does nutraceuticals. Do you see that as something that may be a possibility for them? Yes, absolutely. Um, the health and wellness businesses that are among our members uh, have have found that the China market is an incredibly lucrative one that is um, just beginning to develop, actually. Um, and there's a ton of potential there, but it does really require um, understanding the market and the ins and outs of, of the specific regulations around that stuff, which can be kind of complicated, but absolutely. Okay, um, what about um, hurdles for Arkansas businesses accessing China's internet users? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it definitely is a different, um, a, a different, game than here. Um, obviously, there are huge language barriers, and there are also um, really significant cultural differences in terms of marketing and how to reach um, your target audience. But there are lots of companies, big and small, that specialize in helping uh, U.S. and other foreign com companies um, get their message across, get their advertisements seen, and seen in the right way and calibrated uh, correctly to be successful in the China market. And I'm happy to send that information along if, if there are people on the line who are interested. I would say, yes, that would be great because even if we could post that, one of the things we talk about here at the World Trade Center is that 
um, to export your product and even marketing your services, one of the things that you can do that's low hanging fruit is through e-commerce. And I see that as a, a definite opportunity. And, you know, I think sometimes we kind of take for granted because e-commerce is so easy for us here that really exporting your products that way is, is an easy way and, and, and very moderate in pricing to get the product to the end user. Um, finding representatives. Um, what are some of the other services that your organization provide to people who want to do more business in China? So we're not a we're not a consulting firm, right? So we don't um, we don't really do matchmaking or um, market entry detailed. We don't provide detailed market entry information, but um, we we certainly have a lot of consulting firms among our members, and uh, what we we like to think of ourselves as a trade association, but a little bit deeper than your average trade association in terms of the information and services we provide um, that makes us like kind of a consulting firm light. So if you have particular market entry questions, market access questions, regulatory questions um, to do with your product, a particular port, um, a provincial government um, compliance, with things like um, maybe a factory shut down because of environmental pollution in an industrial park and your factory actually wasn't a polluter and you were trying to figure out how to reopen or you're trying to um, move products to a port through different provinces that have different, last year a, a challenge uh, was that different provinces had different restrictions in place for trucks and um, and other vehicles moving products during COVID. Um, we try to give as much information as we can uh, by seeking, seeking to pull together the information we're hearing from our member companies, many of whom have been in the market for 20, 30 or more years, um, and aggregating that and anonymizing it, and then kind of pointing companies in the right direction in terms of contacts with the Chinese government, um, or, or locals that can help them to answer uh, more specific questions. Sometimes the questions are illegal, sometimes they're technical. Um, and we do something similar on the US side. Okay, that's good to know um, <laughs> how, how we might be able to work with you a little closer through the years. Um, you've given us some really good information. People are cheating and sending me um, things on my phone and uh, <laughs> for questions. So I'm going to read the question that's on my phone, and it's related to IP. Do you feel that the intellectual property um, policies that China is implementing have been better or worse, or are they improving? Are they not improving? Can you give us a little insight on that? Sure. So we do we do a survey of our member companies annually, and we're actually in the process right now of rolling that survey out to members. And I wish that I I wish that we already had it done so that I could tell you the most up to date information. But I can tell you sort of what what the trend has been. Um, over the last 15 years or so, uh, the consistent answer that we've had from companies when we've asked them about uh, their sense of IP protection, IP rights enforcement um, in China is that it is improving. It has been improving, but it's been improving more gradually than they would like, more gradually than they need. Um, and while I think I mentioned, you know, that this was a piece of the phase one agreement, phase one negotiations, um, China has announced some new measures that are significant in terms of what they might mean for business and IP protection. Uh, it still hasn't implemented those measures. So it's hard to say, it, it looks good on paper, but how it ends up being in practice, um, it's still a wait and see. Um, and that's something that we think is important for the Biden administration to push on. Uh, another point, that I, I want to take this time to mention when it comes to IP protection and enforcement, a big focus of the Trump administration's 301 investigation was um, looking into complaints about IP theft as well as tech transfer. And uh, ultimately the findings of the 301 investigation were what drove um, the Trump administration to put tariffs in place largely in order to leverage those tariffs to try to get the Chinese government to change its behaviors to do with IP theft and tech transfer. Um, what our members have told us um, in terms of 
how they see the tech transfer problem versus the way that it was often characterized in the media over the past few years is that, yes, there is a challenge with tech transfer, but it's not, it's not generally speaking for them, the um, theft that it's often described as. It's more an issue of, in China, um, one of the market entry barriers, um, market access barriers in many industry sectors is um, requirements to do with JV ownership, joint venture ownership, where um, if a US or other foreign company wants to enter the market in a particular sector, it can only do so if it has a Chinese partner. And oftentimes the ownership requirements mandate that the Chinese partner have 50% or more of that joint venture, which means that when they're negotiating the joint venture with the Chinese partner, uh, they're at a disadvantage in that negotiation process. And that allows the Chinese partner um, greater leverage to demand access to technology or IP that the company uh, otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't want to put on the table. Um, what we hear from our companies, many of whom are you know, Fortune 500 companies, large companies with access to lots of legal help and um, long experience in the China market is um, they're not putting anything on the table in that negotiation process that uh, feel is it must be protected from theft at all costs in order to maintain their competitive advantage. They're negotiating with a clear cost benefit assessment of including the risk of, of ultimately losing control of that IP or that technology. So um, they don't feel that they're negotiating away anything in general that they can't do without. That being said, uh, they certainly would like to have a level playing field in those negotiations so that they don't have to give up any tech that they wouldn't give up in a level playing field negotiation here in the United States, for instance. Okay. How do you see that IP impacting small to medium-sized companies though? Is it gonna be similar? I, no, I do think that for small and medium-sized companies, the dangers are potentially much more significant because uh, the China market is really different from the US market in terms of uh, the rules, the operating environment, um, common business practices, expectations, cultural differences, um, and so much more language barriers. Um, it, there, there really is, I think, a lot of risk um, involved in trying to identify the right partner to help you with your market entry and your deal negotiation, et cetera. There, there are um, lots of people out there purporting to be uh, quality, honest service providers who aren't necessarily um, you know, a lot of businesses describe it as like the Wild West, uh, but with as much opportunity as there is risk. But I think that's changed a lot over the years. Um, what we hear from our companies now is uh, there is a lot of risk. The opportunity is not quite the same as it used to be. It really is much more like your average developed market these days than a developing market. It's extremely competitive. Um, and you really do need to know what you're doing in order to succeed. But that doesn't mean that a small or medium sized business can't avail itself of opportunities, can't identify those opportunities and take advantage of them. You just need to be, um, don't skimp on, on getting good services um, mm -hmm. providers and uh, make sure that you're, you're, you fully understand and are being very careful about every aspect of your deal. Okay, that's good information to know. And I think it's really good for those SMEs to have a better insight. Um, I think there's an inherent risk in exporting anywhere in the world. So I, you didn't say anything that makes me think that China is more risky than any other place. It's just do your homework and be prepared, do your research and have good partners, identifying who those partners are. Um, so that that's actually kind of well, positive in my opinion. Um, I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions if that's yeah. okay. And one of them is kind of like a crystal ball question because I know you don't know the answer, but uh, it'd be interesting to see what you have to say about it. Um, how do you potentially see the Biden policies impacting um, this, the U.S. and I'm going to ask Arkansas in general? Uh, you know, it is a crystal ball question, mainly because uh, <laughs> we still don't know what the Biden policies are going to be, which is interesting. Right. I think uh, I think. There was a lot of hype around what the Biden policies towards China would be, especially uh, for people like me who are super nerdy focused on, on US-China stuff. But I think even more broadly for, for uh, many Americans, there was 
there were many people asking questions, you know, was the Biden administration going to be weak on China compared to um, Trump administration officials who, especially as 2020 were on with the pandemic, were talking very tough about lots of different aspects of the relationship. Um, are we going to go back to how things were before? Uh, it, are the tariffs going to be rolled back? Are we going to get tariff relief in the near term? Um, are we going to end up having a return to these dialogues that we had where um, we have much more engagement and things are sort of normalized again, but maybe we're not making progress on the problems. Um, what we thought at the outset of this administration was that we were going to, that we would probably see some reduction of the tariffs, but that we wouldn't see a total rollback, um, that there would probably be um, targeted tariff relief and um, also renewal of the exclusion process, that we would see new dialogues and, and greater engagement with China on various issues, but that we would see those things happen after the Biden administration addressed some of its top domestic concerns and after the, the Biden administration approached um, allies and partners and, and tried to build a shared platform on some of these issues with them in order to uh, in order to present a unified front in addressing these issues with China. What we are seeing is uh, some of what we expected and some not what we expected. We haven't seen any tariff relief targeted or otherwise, and we have uh, not had any indication that that's coming. Um, USTR Catherine Tai testified recently on the Biden administration's trade agenda for 2021. She was asked repeatedly about the tariff exclusion process and she was pretty evasive in her answer. She um, wouldn't give any, any clear information about what kind of exclusion process might be renewed, when, um, how expansive it would be. But she did say, you know, the Biden administration continues its assessment, its comprehensive assessment of the Trump administration policies towards China. And uh, this is a piece of it. We don't want to rush it because we want to make sure that we're not putting the cart before the horse. We want to make sure that any policy we roll out um, has a clear objective and is targeted to meet that objective. And when she was pressed about when we'd see the, the exclusions reinstated, she said, uh, one senator asked her, you know, will it be June? Will it be December? She said, December, I would assume would be far too late. So uh, before December, I think we'll see some tariff relief or at least exclusions, um, hopefully well before December. But in terms of, of tariffs and trade, that's kind of all we know right now. Um, and in terms of many of the strategic issues, I think there are a lot of questions too. A big one being, um, how are things going to unfold on the human rights front? What's that going to mean for companies that do business in China or have China as part of their supply chain? What does it mean uh, for the coming months with the, with the Beijing Olympics approaching, which are um, important to the Chinese government, of course. And therefore, if we end up with a boycott or something, we could see retribution um, and new trade restrictions from, from China. Okay. That was long-winded, sorry. No, that's a, it's actually yeah. really, really interesting. And I, your crystal ball is pretty magical. Um, my last question is, is really about just, you know, with your years of experience in working with US-China relations, where do you see this really going? I mean, you seemed very optimistic at the onset. And when you said it's of all the things that are happening, it's really not that bad. It just seems that way. Um, kind of talk to, to us a little bit about that so we can have a better sense of our future and the future opportunities that Arkansas companies have with China. Well, let me, let me reframe it a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the potential in the relationship. I'm not, I'm not entirely optimistic about uh, where the relationship is headed though. I, I think um, it remains to be seen if we are um, going to go down a path where we are able to realize the potential in the commercial relationship or a significant portion of that potential or whether we're gonna go down a path where um, that pot potential is or closed. Um, I think I think we we truly are in a situation where um, the geopolitical issues are creating enormous uncertainties. The ideological tensions and the political tensions are 
very, very significant. And uh, some of that is to do with our tough talk and rhetoric. Um, and that is not a, a partisan thing. It's really coming from both sides. Um, and it is also not an unfounded thing um, because some of that also has to do with uh, Xi Jinping's priorities, the, the way he has directed his own government um, to message about, about China on the world stage and um, some of the policies and actions that he's overseen. So, you know, it's, I think it's really, it w it's in the best interest of Americans, mm -hmm. of Chinese people and the world for this relationship to um, find a new normal that is predictable, that allows for significant commercial engagement um, and that allows us to work together as partners on the issues that, uh, on our common issues such as uh, climate change and uh, and much more, but uh, it, you know, it's not either in, it's not completely in the United States hands or China's hands, uh, whether the relationship is able to realize that potential and whether um, commercial engagement continues to thrive the way that it might. Okay. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and giving us so much information. And I look forward to a follow-up to this conversation in so many different ways ways. I want to thank all the participants for participating and all those people that are working behind the scenes to make sure that we um, got on this call and that everything worked. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I look forward to meeting with all of you. Please reach out at any point or time. There's information on the, on the chat about uschina.org. And I'll repeat www.uschina.org. They have events and information about the programs and you all know how to reach us, World Trade Center, um, at arwtc.org. I look forward to talking with you again, Anna, and I hope you have a beautiful day and thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention, I saw one question uh, in the chat box about whether or not Arkansas is one of the hubs selected to better compete with China with the legislation that Schumer is working on. And I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think that those hubs have been completely determined by any stretch. Um, I think that that's an opportunity that states uh, should be aware of and uh, investigating so that they can go after them. And I I certainly hope that Arkansas, if the legislation passes and those hubs become a reality, that Arkansas is one of them. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much you. for the question. And thank you for catching that in the chat because I can <laughs> <laughs> All right. You have a good day. Thank you so much. You too. Bye. Bye.